My name is Andy Salas. I'm the Humane Educator at Duke okay. County Animal Services. I hold a master's degree in biology with an emphasis in animal behavior. Uh, I did three years of behavioral research with chimpanzees and gorillas at the Lincoln Park Zoo. Uh, I'm also a certified dog trainer and a shelter behavior affiliate. Uh, and I'm actually currently working on my doctorate in learning theory. Uh, so how animals learn, process information, and react to their environment is my jam. That's what I love to do. Uh, and I love sharing what I know uh, with pretty much anybody who will listen. So thank you for sitting in with me today. I really appreciate it. Uh, so I want to apologize to just in case you hear any background noise or some slight barking at my house. I'll try to keep it under control. Uh, we had a minor flood in my house and we're having some emergency construction workers here doing some demolition and repair. So my dogs are a little scatterbrained today because there's a lot of activity, but hopefully we can get through everything. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and kick off our presentation on addressing problem behaviors, which I know is a huge concern for everybody, um, and especially now that we're all home with our animals a lot more, you might be noticing some things that they do that maybe you're not super fond of. So hopefully we can address some of those issues and I can give you some tools that you can use to work on not just those pr uh, problems, but with building a relationship with your pet and hopefully preventing any future issues from arising. All right, so again, thank you for joining us. I love doing these chats. I love sharing what I know with everyone and I super appreciate you spending your morning with me. Uh, so maybe you've added a dog to your family, uh, maybe you already have one, uh, and perhaps things aren't quite going as you thought they would. Um, that's okay, you're doing the right thing, you're starting off here with me, you're learning what you can to address the, be the behaviors you'd like to see changed, uh, and I'll help try to guide you through that. Uh, and at the end of this presentation, I'll also help you with some guidelines if you do need to seek professional help. So if it's a little bit beyond your scope, we'll talk about how you can manage that. And I always like to assure everyone, don't worry if you've got a problem kid at home, we've all got one. So that one is mine right there. Uh, so I actually have three dogs um, and all three of my dogs I got from shelters that uh, had profound behavioral issues that were going to prevent them from being adopted. Uh, and I've worked with them and they're the best fit for my family. So they're gonna stay with me. Uh, but Carmen, who is pictured there uh, while I was trying to take a nice family portrait uh, rolling on the ground is my problem child. Uh, so she suffers from very intense anxiety. She's reactive to noises and people. Um, she's overly enthusiastic with dogs. So she takes a lot of work. Um, and I'm definitely going to incorporate a lot of what I've learned by working with her uh, into this presentation. So hopefully uh, you can have some success with your pets because I'm actually happy to report that Carmen, while she was a mess and still requires some maintenance. Uh, she is actually working on her certification for becoming a therapy dog. So she's made big strides and we're gonna continue to improve and hopefully I can help you do the same. All right, so one thing I always like to address with people is your dog will only ever be as good as his or her trainer is. And for most of our dogs, that trainer is gonna be you. Uh, so when we're dealing with even teaching basic manners, or if we're working on addressing a problem behavior, you get back what you put into it. So there's a lot of responsibility on our shoulders when we take an animal into our home, and we've gotta be prepared to work with them. Uh, so you wanna learn all that you can on training philosophies and techniques. Uh, I'm gonna cover a few today and give you some guidelines for what you should be looking for as appropriate methods to use versus inappropriate. Uh, you definitely, and I can't stress this enough, need to know everything you can learn about dog body language and behavior if you're working with a dog in your home. They have such a subtle way of communicating with us and a lot of times we miss what they're trying to say and then we inadvertently cause problems as a result. Um, so we're going to cover training philosophies and techniques today. I will touch briefly on behavior and body language, uh, but next Tuesday in the evening, I'm going to be doing a more involved presentation that'll give you a lot more detail to help you communicate with your dogs better. Okay. All right, so let's kick it off. So you all are having some problems with your pets, and we're going to address some specific ones that I know a lot of folks have towards the end of this presentation, which will include 
barking in the home, reacting to everything outside when they're on leash, uh, jumping, and a few others. Uh, but before we even get to how we address those specific problems, you need to have some more generalized background knowledge on how you need to be working with your animal productively in the first place. And you need to know what your options are to kind of prevent problems from starting in the first place and then addressing them and hopefully correcting them if they are occurring. Um, and so I'm gonna walk you through a couple different strategies. We're gonna start with what's easiest. Uh, so I know a lot of folks would really love it if their dogs didn't jump on guests when they came in or would prefer they not bark on walks. But, you know, we have to be honest with ourselves. Not everybody has the time or the inclination to really work on those behaviors. Um, so there's some other alternatives for you if that's the case. And that's gonna start with what we call management. Now, management differs from dog training uh, because you're not teaching your animal anything. So when we talk about managing behaviors, you're not teaching your dog to not perform a behavior or to do something different instead. We're just gonna control the environment so we can limit or completely prevent the behavior from occurring at all. So we've got the baby gate here as an example. Um, so this particular person had issues with their dog counter surfing, which is what we call getting up on the counter and sniffing around to try to find all those tasty morsels that we leave behind. That's a problem for a lot of people. Um, so she's managing it. She's got a baby gate up. The dog is no longer allowed in the kitchen. Has that dog learned to not jump on the counters? Absolutely not. If you open up that gate, that dog's gonna get right in there and start looking for a meal. But as long as we keep the gate up, we've managed the behavior. Uh, she could further manage that behavior by just making sure that her countertops are clean. Uh, so I have a major counter surfer in my house. Uh, we're working on it. But while we're working on it and I'm teaching her that that's not an okay behavior that I approve of, I'm managing. So she's not in the kitchen when I'm not there. And when she is in the kitchen, unless we're actually training, I am vigilant to make sure that there is no food on my countertop. There is nothing there to intrigue her to get up there. I'm not teaching her anything yet, and we're not in those circumstances, but I'm managing it so she's not getting rewarded for that behavior. Because every time she gets up there and does find a treat, well, then she thinks, yeah, that's awesome. I'm going to keep doing that, right? And it's really hard to dissuade her from changing her mind. Okay, so some examples of environmental management. Um, and these are actually a couple things that I see as major issues or concerns um, that we've seen have led people to surrender animals to the shelter. Or, for example, when I, I used to train professionally, these were some of the most common things that were addressed. Um, so resource guarding from other dogs. Uh, a lot of people have a multi-dog household. So two or three dogs or a dog and a cat. And you might find that your dog wants to kind of protect their stuff from the other dog, whether that's a special treat, a food bowl, um, a favorite toy. Uh, and you can certainly work on that and improve it, but management is gonna be key as well. Uh, so the easiest way to do that is to separate them when you feed. So I have three dogs in my household. I have three big 60 pound rambunctious dogs in my household. Uh, one of them really prefers it when her siblings stay away from her food. Um, so to make sure everybody's safe and healthy and happy when they're eating, they eat in separate rooms in my house. Um, they have scheduled feedings, the bowl, bowls go down, doors shut until they're done eating. And then once they're all done, bowls come back up and they can interact again. Are they learning to not protect their food from each other? No, but am I keeping them safe and healthy? Absolutely. Um, and resource guarding can sometimes be tricky to completely train away, if you will. Uh, so we wanna make sure that we are managing as part of that um, training plan. Uh, for those of you that have dogs that are reactive at windows, which is a big concern, um, management is going to be key. Um, and you're going to find that as a reoccurring theme, even as I talk about training strategies, management is key. Uh, because when behaviors are being rewarded, they're going to continue. And for a dog, getting all hyped up and jumping around at the window and barking is rewarding in and of itself because it's fun, right? So it gets their adrenaline pumping. It feels good. So of course they're gonna keep doing it because it's awesome. So why would they not? So as we train them to do something different, which there is a light at the end of the tunnel, you can correct that, I'll get there. You have to manage it because if they're continually allowed to do it while you're trying to train them not to, well, they're rewarding themselves for barking at the window. So they're gonna keep doing it regardless of what you do. So you have to pair management with training. 
So there is opaque film that you can get at a lot of home goods stores that you can, it comes in sticky strips and you can put it just across the bottom of your window. If you've got a short dog, you can put it all the way up halfway or cover a whole window if you need to. Um, it prevents the dogs from clearly seeing outside, which means they're not gonna be barking because they're not getting that stimulus. Uh, you can also just be diligent about making sure you're closing curtains and blinds, especially if you've got peak times during the day when you know there's um, extra activity on your street. So even with my dogs, I've been working with them on reactivity. They're pretty good, but I know there's tons of kids on my sidewalk at 6.30 or so in the morning when they're going to the bus stop and again right around 3 when they're getting dropped off. I close my curtains because we're not going to reward that behavior of barking at people as they run by the house. Um, so that's another way that you can manage. And what you'll find in many of these cases, even as we talk about training, management is going to always be part of it because we have to manage the behavior to minimize it and then train to either get the behavior to diminish uh, or to replace it with a different behavior that we approve of. Uh, now, other things um, that you can manage environmentally with pretty simple ease um, is things like fearful of new places. Uh, so we see that a lot, especially at the shelter. We get a lot of nervous dogs and secure dogs, dogs that we don't have any backstory on. So we don't know where they came from or what their experiences were. And they're fearful of new places. They, you know, they maybe don't feel super comfortable going into the pet store or going to a dog park. Um, so my simple answer for that with a lot of folks that have fearful dogs is stay at home. Uh, you know, you can work on it gradually and get them into places, but that's very overwhelming and takes a lot of time and effort um, and a lot of times some professional assistance as well. So sometimes we also have to acknowledge that our dogs have limitations just like we might and we might have to change our expectations for them. Uh, so I have my first uh, dog that uh, I adopted from a shelter. He lived there for three years, uh, all the way from three months old to three years. A shelter was his only world. Uh, and he doesn't like to go to pet stores and he doesn't really like uh, going to busy places to walk. It makes him nervous. And we've worked on it and he's gotten better over time. But really, ultimately, I manage that for him. So we keep his world smaller because that's what keeps him happier. Um, and I had to change my expectations for my dog. Uh, so that's something that we also need to consider when we're working with our animals at home. Okay. Uh, and then one of the last major issues that I see that can be easily corrected with environmental management is resource guarding from humans. Uh, so I hear that all the time. Well, I tried to take the toy out of my dog's mouth and they growled at me. And I think, well, yeah, you tried to steal their stuff, you know? So I'm not gonna freely give somebody all my stuff that I'm currently playing with if they just come along and grab it. Um, so, I mean, with resource guarding from humans, one of the biggest things that we can do is just leave our dogs alone when they're enjoying something. If you just gave them a big tasty bone, let them have it, right? If they're eating their dinner, leave them alone. We don't need to stick our fingers in their bowl or step near them. We wouldn't like that if people did it to us. So we need to make sure we're respecting their space as well. Now, again, there are things that we can do to reduce resource guarding if it's a concern, but management, again, is going to be key. And a lot of that is making sure that we're respecting our animal space. Now, as we continue on with environmental management, and this is something you're also going to consider when you are training your dogs or trying to work on different behaviors, you want to avoid what is called trigger stacking. So trigger stacking occurs when multiple stressors kind of add on top of one another. So you can even think about it in terms of your own day. So perhaps you wake up a little late because your alarm didn't go off in the morning. So we're frustrated, right? And we get a little crabby. And then maybe you stub your toe getting out of bed. That's another trigger. And then you go to get in the shower and maybe your hot water heater is broken. So good morning, ice cold shower, right? That's another trigger. You get in your car to go to work and traffic is terrible. And then by the time you get to work, you are so over your threshold, the amount of stress that you can handle, that your day is pretty much a bummer from there on out. And it can be difficult to focus, it can be difficult to come back around, and it certainly could be difficult to learn. Uh, so we need to be aware of that with our dogs, especially if you're working with a reactive kiddo. So if you've got a dog that does a lot of barking, that goes a little nuts on a leash when they see people, dogs, squirrels, whatever it might be, you have to pay attention to them. So every animal has a threshold. So their threshold, say it's here, anything below, they can listen to you, they can acknowledge you, they're aware of your presence, uh, they can maintain a relatively calm body posture. 
Once they get over their threshold, learning has stopped and you can't fix that. You cannot teach any creature over their threshold. Um, they can't learn, they can't focus on you. And frankly, in most cases, they can't hear you. Uh, so especially for those of you that have really barky dogs in the home or out on walks, once they're up over that threshold, they can't hear you. So the goal is to manage their environment so they don't get there. Um, and then also, if they do get there, to look to the environment first to correct that. So again, for example, if you got a barky dog in your house and they've gone nuts and they're pacing back and forth at that window going crazy barking, you can't train them right now. They're over threshold, but we can start to manage the environment. Close the curtains first, let them calm down, and then we can work on teaching alternative behaviors. Okay. So I wanted to use what we know now about environmental management in an example. So how we can manage a dog that jumps on visitors, for example. This is something I hear very commonly as a concern. Well, we have to first think about our environmental management. So we can put up baby gates. Uh, again, I have three 60 pound dogs. They think people coming over are awesome, uh, sometimes too awesome. And I live in a raised ranch. So when people come through my front door, my dogs can go from all the way in our upper level down a flight of stairs, full speed and charge right into people. It wasn't pleasant at first when we moved into this house. We had to work on it. The first thing I did is I put up baby gates. So my dogs have baby gates at the bottom of the stairs. We have another setup right by the front door. My dogs can't get to the visitors when they're over threshold, which is gonna happen. Somebody rang the doorbell, knocked on the door, they came in, my dogs are jazzed, they're gonna run to that person, but I've managed the environment. Those gates stop them and they're gonna stay on that side of the gate until we can get calm behaviors, get them back under thresholds, and then we work on meeting our visitor. We can also do things like uh, placing a dog in a crate or a safe space. That can be a room that is calm and quiet. Uh, that can actually be their crate, but prevent them from getting over threshold in the first place. We're not gonna do trigger stacking because before our visitors come, we're gonna put them in a crate, maybe play some calming music, give them something to distract them, like a Kong or a special chew. Um, it's gonna take them a little while to work on. So that's a decent way to manage a dog that jumps on visitors. I'm either stopping them before they get there or I'm putting them away before they get hyped up. So we don't see that as a problem. And then once the visitors are there or settled in, that's the time that you can calmly bring your dog out. You can work with treats and we can talk about different ways to kind of teach them an alternative way to say hello. Um, but they can't learn that if our environment's not managed and they get over threshold through trigger stacking. So that's definitely something to consider when you're looking at your environmental management uh, and you're looking at some kind of usually frustrating or sort of irritating behaviors that our dogs do like jumping and barking. Environmental management is always gonna be that first step to working on preventing that and decreasing it. Okay, so now I wanna move into some more of our training theories uh, and ways that we can approach our dogs when they are in a proper space to learn from us. So in every presentation I do on dog body language behavior training, I always start here with dominance theory because it is probably one of the most prevalent methods that are used to train dogs. Uh, and it has been disproven as effective scientifically and it has also been demonstrated to create a lot of later behavioral and physical problems in our dogs when used. So first let's address what dominance theory is. It is a scientific theory, uh, which as a biologist, I'm ashamed to say that this was real science back in the 1940s. Um, but dominance theory originated from a 1947 study that was done on captive wolves. Uh, so what occurred is they went and they caught five juvenile male, adult juvenile uh, wolves, uh, and they put them in a, in a zoo in 1947. And in 1947, a zoo was basically a, a cinder block cell. Uh, so now these wolves that did not know each other were in a confined, unnatural space. They provided them with one feeding station and they fed them once a day and then observed what occurred. And what occurred was the biggest, baddest wolf strolled in there and kind of threw down, was ready to fight, was growling, snarling, biting, and all the other wolves would back off. That wolf would eat his fill, he would walk away, and then the next biggest, baddest wolf would come in and it would all go all the way down that pecking order till the weakest wolf finally was left with scraps or nothing. Okay. So from that observation, we came up with this idea that there's a social hierarchy in which there's an alpha member and they control all of the resources. So that alpha wolf is the boss, he gets to get what he wants first, everybody else gets what he says they can have later. 
And we determined that individuals constantly fight to gain dominance and that alpha position so they can get the most resources. Now, for us, that makes sense because humans are all about hierarchies. We really like to know who we're the boss of, who's the boss of us. That's important to us. We like that structure. Okay. But dominance theory for animals doesn't work. So the original theory was debunked, thankfully, uh, when somebody in the 70s, another scientist said, hey, that seems unusual and that's not what I think happens. So he went and studied wolves in the wild to see, do they really have this alpha hierarchy where they trickle down resources? And what he found was, no. So wolves live in family groups. So there's a mom and dad and offspring that live with them. And sometimes there might be a sister or a brother of mom or dad living in that environment. So aunts and uncles. And what they found is it acts very much so like a nuclear family. So the older, more mature wolves typically tend to make more of the decisions with the younger wolves kind of following along. But as they grow and develop, they seem to get a little bit more of a say in what the wolf, uh, what the pack does and how they share resources. So it's very much so like a family. Now that was great. And it changed the way that we thought about wolves, but even without that study, the dominance theory, so this idea that if we're gonna work with dogs, we need it to be the alpha, shouldn't work anyways, because wolves are wolves and dogs are dogs. And we're talking about two separate species that behave very differently. So wolves evolve behaviors from thousands, hundreds of thousands of years in the wild, so they could become the best fit for their environment. We created dogs through artificial breeding. So we can't take wolf behaviors and assign them to dogs at all. And what we found when we've studied dogs uh, which studying dogs' natural behaviors can be difficult because they're not natural. We've created them. Uh, but we have been able to do studies in India where there is a fairly large feral dog population. And what they found is that dogs don't have any sort of social structure at all. So they may live in big groups, but members of those groups will disappear for a few days, weeks, months, go off and do who knows what. Then they might come back. They might come back with a friend. They might come back with pups. Uh, and they're accepted the same way they were when they were there originally, but there's no long lasting bonds. They drift in and out of social groups and there's no hierarchy. So dominance in this case is a lot more fluid. So if one dog, for example, has a big tasty meaty bone, they might want it right now and they might growl and display and chase off anybody else while they want it. But when they've chewed on it enough and they're done, they're gonna walk away from it and they're not gonna care who else gets it. They're not gonna come back and say, I want it later and try to cause a ruckus to get it. So they're a lot more fluid. So they only want something for a little while and then you can have it and they don't mind. Okay. So we need to pay attention to that when we are working with our dogs. Uh, so from dominance theory, we saw a lot of harmful aversive training techniques come about. A lot of punishment-based training um, and a lot of, again, that human as the alpha. So we see things like alpha rolling where dogs were being rolled over on their backs and held down until they submitted to a human to learn. And thankfully, through scientific study, we've learned that that's not how dogs view dominance. For them, it's all about relationships with individuals at one specific point, and then it can change at the next. Uh, and so when we work with dominance theory and these aversive techniques, what we're finding is that we're actually just causing a lot of harm. Uh, so any training plans that you may have encountered in your own lifetime with a dog or that you may encounter in the future if you seek out professional help, uh, any training plan that encourages maintaining dominance over an animal or the use of pain or other aversive techniques has not only been scientifically proven to be ineffective, but demonstrates that it can be uh, potentially um, damaging to your dog in the long term. Okay. So instead, what we look for is what we call Lima training. So Lima training is what I do at the shelter. It's what I've done in my own professional training career. And Lima stands for least intrusive, minimally aversive training. So it's all science-based, which is awesome. So we know that every decision we're making has been supported by research. Um, and it also provides you a systematic way to address problems and develop strategies to solve any issues that you're having at home, which I love. Um, so science is all about taking the right steps to get to your results. Lima-based training is the same. Um, I also feel that it is one of the best approaches for novice trainers as well, because it is going to give you that stepwise approach to working with your dogs. And of course, it maintains the importance of agency for the learner. Where dominance theory takes away choice, agency from our dogs, Lima training gives it back to them. We want to let them have some choice in their learning and allow them uh, to be empowered through the, the training process. 
So when we look at LEMA training, it follows what's called the humane hierarchy of behavior. And this is where we start to see that stepwise approach to our animal training. So step one, if you have a problem with your animal, you want to first start with health, nutrition, and physical factors. So especially if you've got a behavioral problem, even something like barking at strangers out the window, if it came on suddenly, you're going to want to address some health factors because one of my guesses would be that your dog is starting to lose some of their sight. So my nieces, for example, have an aging dog who used to love people. Now she growls at them as they approach on walks. She has cataracts. She can't see them clearly. So it's becoming a little bit more of a stressor for her rather than a positive encounter. Uh, so you definitely want to look at that. A lot of naughty behaviors that we're not fond of can be the result of loss of vision or hearing. It could be the result of pain. Um, we can also see some of this brought about by nutrition. Um, so one of my dogs is crazy hyperactive. If she gets the wrong grains in her diet, I'm sorry, she's barking now. Um, so we have to pay attention to her diet. And then, of course, you have to look at physical factors as well. And when I talk about physical factors, I'm talking about, are they getting enough exercise? So are they getting that time to run and play and dig and jump and do all of those normal dog things that they want to do? Because if they're not, they're going to put that energy somewhere else, which is usually going to be in a behavior that we don't like to see. Okay. So then the next step is antecedents. And that's going to come up again here in just a few minutes. Antecedents refer to what is occurring before the behavior starts. Uh, and that's something that we tend to kind of put blinders on and don't pay attention to. We get really focused and frustrated on the behavior that we don't like. You have to look at what happened before. So when I work with anybody that has a dog that's demonstrating an undesirable behavior, I ask them to keep a journal. So pay attention to the environment. So your dog just started barking. What happened? Was there a squirrel outside, a bird? Was it a person? Did a car go by? Did they hear a siren? Let's talk about that because then we can tailor make a training plan that's going to address that specific issue and help your dog overcome that overreaction to a stimulus. Then our next step is positive reinforcement. So that's going to be using positive methods to train behaviors that we like. Um, and some of that is going to help diminish behaviors we dislike. And some of it's also just going to be helping to build that bond and reinforce the animal turning to you anytime they feel uncertain, have questions about their environment, or are not sure how to react. After positive reinforcement, our next step in the humane hierarchy is differential reinforcement of alternative behaviors, which is a really long, complicated way of saying we're going to teach them to do something we like instead of something we don't like. So for example, if you've got a dog, again, that's jumping on people, teach them to sit uh, and really reinforce that sit. We're gonna work on sit constantly. You get rewarded for sitting. So that way when they meet new people, instead of that instinct to jump up, they're gonna have an instinct to plant their bottom on the ground instead. They can't jump when they're sitting. So now we've got a different alternative behavior that's going to prevent that dog from performing the behavior we don't like. Then the next step is negative punishment, negative reinforcement or extinction. Um, so what that's referring to in terms of negative punishment, uh, which a lot of people cringe sometimes when you say punishment too, doesn't always have to be a bad thing. Uh, so negative punishment means I'm going to take something uh, positive away to decrease a behavior. Um, so again, I'll use the jumping as an example. If a dog jumps on you, they're seeking attention, right? So even if you push them off, yell no, anything like that, that might seem punishing, you got attention or they got attention. So they're thinking, yeah, mom's talking to me. So they're going to keep doing it. Negative punishment means I'm going to take the thing the dog wants away to decrease the behavior. So if my dogs jump on me, I turn my back to them. And if I have to, I'll walk away or I'll leave the room. If you jump on me, I'm not going to pay attention to you. So that's a negative punishment. And so my dogs have learned now, they'll sometimes come running at me and they'll go to jump and they go, oh, wait, nope, sorry. And they'll stay on the ground or they'll sit. Uh, and then I give them rubs, I'll give them treats, they get the attention they were looking for. Um, so that's gonna be your next step in your training plan is what can we do to diminish the behavior? Uh, and usually that is tied in directly with what can we stop ourselves from doing that might be inadvertently encouraging the behaviors. And then the last stop on the humane hierarchy of behavior is positive punishment which I put on here because it is included on our humane hierarchy. So if you're looking at the scientific method, it is there, but it is not something that I ever advocate using. So positive punishment means the addition of something aversive to decrease a behavior. So that usually means that we're adding something uh, a dog doesn't like, oftentimes that they find uncomfortable or painful to stop the behavior from occurring. 
The only time I ever have used that myself is if the dog was a direct danger to myself or to others. Um, and that's just a temporary stop gap to get a behavior to stop in that moment. So you can go back to the top of that humane hierarchy and address what started the behavior in the beginning. Um, so it is there, but that's definitely not where we wanna start. And hopefully we seek professional help before we feel like positive punishment is where we need to go to correct our behaviors. So just because I like visuals, I threw this on here. Uh, this is what our humane hierarchy looks like. So you can kind of think of it as a road with exits and how you're addressing your behavioral problems. Again, starting with health, nutrition, and physical settings, moving on to antecedents, positive reinforcement, so on and so forth. Um, but this is how this is a stepwise process for you to follow. You start at stop one. If that's not gonna work for you, it's not addressing the issue, you move on to step two, step three, step four, and again, uh, as the image indicates where you've got the slow down and then the stop signs, uh, when you get to negative reinforcement, negative punishment, and positive punishment, when you're getting to those points, if you're creating the training plan on your own and you're not getting the results you want, this is when I strongly advocate for seeking out a professional to help guide you through it then. Let them go back, review what you've already done, see if they can tweak things and help them or let them help you manage if you have to get into any sort of punishers to change a behavior. So you're doing it effectively uh, and in a way that will um, not cause any long time, uh, long term damage to your dog's uh, behavioral health. Okay. So when we are training, so as we're using our Lima based humane hierarchy, uh, what we're really addressing is operant conditioning, which some of you may be familiar with uh, and some may not. Um, operant conditioning, I love for new dog trainers as well because it's super easy. You've got this visual, you can see the quadrants that we use and where we wanna try to keep ourselves is going to be in that positive reinforcement area. So we're gonna add good stuff to increase a behavior. Or we might want to work in that negative punishment area, which is delaying good stuff to decrease a behavior. Um, so here we've got an example for loose leash walking. So positive reinforcement, if I want my dog to walk in a heel position beside me, is I'm going to reward the heck out of that behavior. So even when your dog has it down pat, I always tell people, especially on walks, you should be carrying treats because you're going to want to pay them for paying attention to you because there's a lot of stimulus outside in that world and it's not fair to ask them to not be dogs and react to it. So you need to make yourself more interesting. Uh, when you're starting out, you're going to be treating a lot. So positive reinforcement means lots of treats as they're walking beside you. You can drop them on the ground slightly behind them so it'll slow them down as they're walking with you. Or my trainer trick when I'm teaching a dog to loose leash walk, I actually walk with a long wooden kitchen spoon covered in peanut butter. And so then as they walk with me, I just gently drop it down, they get a lick, and then I pull it back up. If they stay with me every couple of steps, I drop it down and they get a lick. Uh, if we're working with negative punishment for loose leash walking, you can see there on the image, the gentleman walking that dog, the dog's pulling, so the gentleman stopped. So that's a simple, easy, non-aversive way to correct that behavior. Every time your dog pulls ahead of you and there's tension on the leash, stop and wait. And they don't get to move, they don't get to keep going towards what they wanted to see until they turn around and come back to you and then you start off on your walk again. Um, and then you've moved into positive punishment and negative reinforcement, which again, if we're using those, we want to make sure that we're seeking out professional help. Positive punishment is what we want to avoid. So that would be using leash pops, so yanking on a dog's leash to get them close to you, or using aversive collars like shock collars or prongs to get a dog to stay near you. That's going to be using pain uh, to address a training issue and can result in unwanted uh, behavioral issues later on. Now, the big rule for operant conditioning in any type of training is as you are working through it, if the behavior continues, it's being rewarded. So I see a lot of people that tell me they've been working with their dog for sometimes years before they sought uh, uh, professional help. And no matter what they're doing, the dog keeps doing what they don't want it to. That's because you're rewarding it somehow. Uh, and what I'll say as we get into training is that punishment and rewards are in the eye of the beholder. So for example, my dog, Carmen, she hates having her head touched. That's fine. Uh, but when she used to um, work with her previous owner, they said they had a difficult time getting her to come to them reliably when they called. Uh, so when they explained what they were doing, they were calling Carmen to her. And when Carmen would arrive, they would reward her by petting her on the head, which seems nice, right? It's sweet. We're reaching out to our dogs. We're trying to bond. We're rubbing their ears. Carmen hates that. So Carmen stopped coming when they were calling because in her eyes, the reward they were giving her was actually a punisher. 
And you can see the same thing if we go back to the jumping example. A lot of people that have dogs jump up on them, they push them off, they yell at them, they tell them to go away. You know, they maybe get a little irritated sometimes. But in the dog's eyes, that might be a reward because what they wanted was attention from you. And it might be loud attention, it might be kind of rough attention, but they're getting attention, so it's rewarding. And then for things like barking at windows, for example, again, that's why environmental management is so important. If they're able to do it unchecked and get over threshold and get all wild and crazy and feel good, they're rewarding themselves. So if it's continuing in your home, despite what you think you, uh, despite the measures you think you've taken to prevent it, somehow it's being rewarded. So you have to figure out what that reward is for the animal and figure out then what a suitable non-aversive punishment might be that would cause the behavior to decrease if you end up at that um, step in your uh, humane hierarchy. Okay. Uh, so as we're working with our ABCs, uh, which is the learning theory of operant conditioning, this is gonna be your major focus. So again, we've mentioned this already with the humane hierarchy. We tend to get focused very much so on the behavior. We fixate on what our dog's doing and we might be thinking about the consequences, but we fail to consider the antecedents, what came before. So if you've got a dog, again, that's barking like crazy at the windows, why? So let's see if we can address that because once we can identify what's exciting them, we can start to work on that. Um, and then from changing that antecedent, whether that be uh, training a different behavior, so teaching them a cue uh, to not maybe do what they were doing that we didn't like. It might be managing the environment, it might be being conscious of trigger stacking, um, and maybe even training, uh, changing our training approach. Then we're going to have an effect on the behavior. Now, what consequently is going to have an effect on the behavior is the consequences that follow it. So remember, we want good stuff to happen to increase behavior. We want good stuff to stop to decrease behavior. Uh, we want to avoid, again, those red areas of positive punishment or negative reinforcement uh, unless we're working with a professional. Um, but a quick note, as we're helping our animals associate uh, what we want them to do with a reward system, so this will be applicable uh, when we're trying to change our antecedents by perhaps teaching a dog an incompatible behavior, we want to make sure that they understand that the behavior gets the consequence. So if we're going to positively re uh, reward a dog for sitting instead of jumping on someone, they need to understand that the sit is what got them that reward. And we can do that by marking behaviors. So when you mark a behavior, that means that you're going to use either a clicker, which many people are familiar with, and I use them. So when my dog does something that I like, I click, and then they get a treat or other, another reward. One of my dogs loves to play tug of war. So it could be a click and a game of tug of war. Uh, if you're not comfortable with a clicker or don't have one and want to work on your training at home, you can also use a verbal marker. So a lot of people use yes. So, and I use that if I don't have a clicker, if my dog does something I like, yes, and then here's a reward. It allows them to associate the behavior they just did with the reward that's coming. Um, it's also easier for trainers because you really only have just a couple of seconds to either reward or punish a behavior for the animal to make an association. And we're clumsy, right? So it takes us a little while to get a cookie out of a treat bag or get a piece of cheese out for the dog to reward them for that behavior that we like. So the clicker buys us time. The clicker marks the behavior. So they go, oh, something good happened. And then they can turn to look for the reward and they'll still have that positive association. Oh, sorry. Now, um, when you are um, working with a clicker or a verbal marker, you do have to first form a positive association with that marker. Um, it's easy, it takes about five seconds. You're gonna sit with your animal and if you're gonna use a clicker, for example, you're gonna click, they don't have to do anything. They can lay with you, stand there, I don't care. Click, treat, click, treat, do that you know, five to 10 times and they're gonna go, okay, clicker means something good is happening. Same thing with your verbal marker. Okay. Now, before we get into specific training problems, I have just a quick blurb here that most training problems are a result of miscommunication. So we have to make sure that when we're working with our animals, that we are being very clear and more importantly, very consistent about what we're telling them and how we're telling them. We also have a big responsibility to learn what they're telling us. Uh, so that's going to be something that we'll focus on when we do the body language and behavior presentation next week. But if we're not reading our animals' body cues appropriately, we might be increasing stress, 
We might be ignoring physical pain, not intentionally, of course. We may be missing out on signs of things like anxiety uh, or even our dogs being over threshold, which puts them in a place where they cannot learn from us. So it's really important that we're paying attention to that. Now, when we talk body language and behavior, I always love to start with people because we do a lot of things incorrectly when we work with our dogs. So when we are working with our dogs, when we're trying to correct a behavior, when we're doing active training, when we're just hanging out and playing, we need to pay attention to our bodies. So shoulders, for example, are they overly forward? Are you reaching over your dog? That can be intimidating and cause a lot of stress. Uh, are they too far back? Are you being rigid? Um, again, that can go back. We see that a lot with the dominance theory training. We have to be big and bad and you know, tougher than our dogs that can make them very uncomfortable. So you need to make sure that you're rolling your shoulders back, that you're comfortable, you're standing kind of hip cocked, relaxed when we're working with our dogs so we're not being an imposing figure over the top of them. You know, are you standing versus kneeling? Uh, you know, if you've got a dog that's got some fear issues, for example, with other people, when they come in, have them get low, be small. So that way you're not as intimidating to the dogs. Are you leaning forward and reaching out? Which is something I tell everybody with dogs, please do not do and do not encourage anybody meeting your dogs to do so. That's a very invasive posture. We lean over them, we put our faces by their faces and then we stick our hands right into that, their space. I wouldn't want to hang out with a person who did that to me, right? But we do that to dogs all the time. So we need to make sure that we are not invading their space. And again, that goes back to allowing an animal agency. They have to have the option to move away from us or come back. Uh, if we're working with our dogs, are we paying attention to our approach? Are you approaching rapidly at them? That can be seen as threatening um, and can certainly make animals uncomfortable or feel like they've done something wrong, um, which is where a lot of people get that my dog knows he did something wrong if he peed or pooped on the rug, because a lot of times if we see it happening, we rush over there and then the dogs do that slinky tail, head down, they avoid our gaze and we think, oh, you know you did something wrong. No, it's because we scared the bejeepers out of them when we approached them so fast. So we have to pay attention to that. Uh, are you approaching directly or indirectly? So the proper appropriate way to approach any dog, yours or others, is to do it in sort of a U formation. So we never walk directly at the dog. We take our time and we walk around them to approach their side. That's how dogs politely greet each other. It's something that we can pay attention to when we work with them as well. And a lot of times with dogs, especially if I'm working with a new animal that maybe doesn't know me very well or is nervous, I tend to train slightly turned to the side. So that way they know I don't mean them any harm and I'm showing them my side, which is a signal for many animals that you just want friendship. Uh, things like hugging, and this always gets a lot of awes when I say this. Most dogs, I'm gonna say most, they don't like to be hugged. Uh, so like that poor pooch in that photo, we might think what an adorable picture, they're smooshing their faces together. What I'm seeing from that dog is a tight jawline, ears all the way back, we've got whale eyes, so I'm seeing the whites of their eyes. Those are all clear stress signals in dogs. So that dog is saying, please, please, please let me go. Uh, so primates, including humans, we are the only species on this planet that like sternal, uh, sternum to sternum contact. We're the only ones that find comfort from chest to chest contact. Every other animal actually views that as a threatening posture. So some dogs learn to like it. Some dogs can be trained to like it. Some weirdo dogs didn't read that book and they like it from birth. I have a dog who loves getting hugs. So some dogs will enjoy it. Most do not. So when we're talking about contact with our animals or for anybody that's got kiddos at home, follow a three second rule. So any type of contact you do with a dog, three seconds, let them go, see if they move away. Then that's a clear sign from them that they did not appreciate what you were doing or see if they come on back to you. Uh, now you can also think about your eye contact when we're training dogs. And that's something I see a lot when folks are training and, or they're trying to correct behavior and they're like, they're not getting it. They're not listening to me. And what I see when I watch them is they're staring at their dog like this as they're training, maintaining eye contact and never looking away because we're so focused. That's very unnerving for a dog. So make sure you can make eye contact, but look away. So make sure they don't feel targeted or kind of oppressed or dominated over. We want to make sure that they're feeling comfortable with us. And then of course, if our dogs give us any calming signals like yawning, for example, or turning their head away from us, those are all signs that they're done, they're stressed, they need to calm down. We can help by mirroring that. So if a dog yawns at you when they're not tired, you can yawn back. And that's a good way of, them, of telling them like, we're all calm and we can be okay here. Okay. Now, when we're working with our dogs, we also have to pay attention not only to what we're saying to them with our bodies, but what they are saying to us. 
So this again, we'll touch very quickly on. Um, I'm not worried about it so much from the top end. So this is what's called the canine ladder of aggression. So these are the signs that we see that if they're ignored can lead to a bite. But we also can apply this to training. So if you look towards the bottom of that ladder, those are called stress or appeasement signals. Those are signs from a dog that they are stressed out, um, that you're upsetting them, that they just want to be friends and want everybody to calm down, that they're overwhelmed. Those are all things we need to pay attention to. One, when we're trying to manage our environment, because those are signs that your dog is getting trigger stacked and going over threshold. So as you start to see those start to compound on one another, you're seeing a dog that's getting more and more overwhelmed. Uh, and we also can pay attention to these for active training because as we start to see some of these signs, that's our dog letting us know that they've had enough and they can't learn any further and we need to make sure we respect that. So it all starts with yawning, blinking. So you'll see a lot of blinking. Uh, you might see nose licking. So the tongue will go straight out, lick their nose and go back in. Uh, that is a stress signal from a dog. They might start to turn their head away. So maybe you're working with your dog and they're training and they're doing great and they're focused on you and then all of a sudden you're getting a lot of this. That's them just quietly telling you that they can't do this anymore. They're all done. Uh, you might see that extended by turning the whole body away. You might get paw raises. Um, and then, of course, if you're allowing your dog agency and the ability to do so, you'll see a lot of them just choose to get up and walk away from you when they've had too much. And the important part about training and any behavioral modification we do is you need to let them do that so we don't end up with a stressed dog that feels like they need to continue crawling up that ladder to communicate with us. Um, and then, of course, the rest of the ladder, we won't sit, get into too much because that's more for general body language and behavior. Hopefully, we're not pushing our dogs to the point where they have to continue to climb and reach a bite. Um, but I always love to put this in every presentation I do because we see pictures like this all the time on the internet. So isn't that adorable? She's playing with her dog. What a cute family photo. But again, this is what I see. So I see a stiff dog. I see a furrowed brow. I see a tense, tight mouth. I see a wide-eyed whale stare. This is a dog that is super uncomfortable and is actually very near to approaching a bite. Uh, so we need to pay attention to this, not only for our safety, uh, but for our dog's mental well-being, and then as well as to maintain a good positive relationship where we all can learn as well. Okay. All right, so now let's get into the nitty gritty. So some of our major uh, behavioral problems. Um, pulling on a leash is one. I know I've used it as an example, so we'll go through it quickly. Um, if you've got a dog that's pulling on a leash, so they are taking you for a drag and not for a walk around the block, you need to start your ABCs. So why are they pulling? What is motivating them? Is it excitement? Is it frustration? Is it fear? Uh, so for example, if you've got a little dog that always goes bananas when they see a bigger dog, um, or I know I heard the mention of when large cars or trucks go by, that's probably some fear that's causing pulling and then reactivity, which we're going to address. So that's going to require some counter conditioning. We have to teach our animals that that's an okay thing and it doesn't pose any threat to them. Um, so to do that, we're going to apply operant conditioning. Uh, so first and foremost, we're going to start with positive reinforcement. Uh, so we're gonna reward when they are walking next to us. And what I always like to stress for folks when we talk about leash issues, whether it's pulling on the leash or reactivity, which we'll get to in a moment, Walking on a leash outside in the big wide world, uh, in terms of dog education, that is a college level behavior. So they need to have so much more training under their belt before they can get there. Uh, so they need to know how to sit on cue in a variety of environments. They need to know how to look at you and pay attention and refocus. And then they need to be able to practice the actual leash walking in a non-stimulating environment. So I always tell everyone, if you're having problems on the leash, take it back to the basics, start practicing in your home where they're going to be more likely to pay attention to you. It's not as stimulating and you're pretty much the coolest thing in the room at the time. So they're gonna look at you and you're gonna do, still do that crazy rewarding, but you're gonna walk in the house. And then you can start changing up the rooms you walk in and then you can go in the backyard and then up and down the driveway and then up and down the street. It's a process to get where you need to be. Now, if your dog is pulling on the leash and you've tried positive reinforcement, and hopefully we're always doing that, we're rewarding for the good, we're gonna start teaching incompatible behaviors. 
uh, so you can start teaching them instead of pulling forward um, to sit when they get excited. Um, it seems counterintuitive because then they're just sitting in the middle of the sidewalk, but it's better than the pulling at least. Um, and then you can move that to a more positive behavior. Uh, so you can do that by just rewarding the heck out of sits in general. Um, and then practice that as you walk again, first in your home, backyard, driveway, and then up and down the streets. And so what you'll start to see is dogs that when they get a little unsure of the world, instead of pulling and acting crazy, they might just plop their bottoms down on the ground, which is a lot better and a lot easier on our shoulders. Uh, you can do things like negative punishment. So we're still in that green area for the quadrants of operant conditioning. Negative punishment is super easy for leash walking. Play games with your dogs. So red light, green light. Um, I do that with my dogs all the time. We're walking. The minute they get too far ahead of me, I put on the brakes and I stop. I let them catch themselves at the end of the leash and we stay red light until you come back to me. Then it's green light and off we go again. Uh, you can also do crazy walking. So it's very hard for a dog to pull on you if they don't know where you're going. Uh, so I'm sure a lot of people in my neighborhood think I am absolutely nuts. Uh, but when I walk my dogs, we zigzag back and forth across the street. We might weave in and out of mailboxes and trees. But my dogs, when they're walking next to me, are eyes up looking at me because they have no idea where I'm going. And to keep up, they got to watch. Okay. And then for management. So if you're not interested in doing the training, well, it depends on the motivators. So if your dog's super excited when there's other dogs or kids out, walk during quiet times. Um, you know, and so when I first take my dogs from that basic kindergarten level of walking in my house and then backyard, driveway, et cetera, when I start walking in neighborhoods, I start doing it at weird times. So we walk at 4.30 in the morning and 11 o'clock at night because nobody else is out there. So they can get used to the environment without the extra stimulation. Uh, you can also be flexible on destinations. So if you're starting a walk and you've planned to go one way and there is a bunch of kids playing in the street and you know it's gonna make your dogs crazy, rethink where you're going. Maybe backtrack a little bit, go around another block, whatever you might need to do. And then of course, for the ba most basic management, it's just don't walk. Um, you don't have to, it's not a requirement for dogs. You can exercise them in other ways through play, games, and outdoor activities in your yard. Okay. All right, now reactivity. I know this was a big one for a lot of folks. Reactivity um, can be uh, lunging and uh, growling on the leash. It can be barking at the windows. All reactivity really means is that they are overreacting to something, something that we think is a pretty benign stimulus and your dog is going bananas over it. It's really common. So most dogs don't have the best impulse control. We've got to teach it. So we have to start looking at our ABCs again. So when you're working with reactivity, the antecedent, so what is coming before the reactivity is going to be critical for you to identify. What is it that makes your dog go bonkers? I um, mean, for many dogs, it's a handful of things. So it's not gonna be one specific, um, but you'll find that there's gonna be a few things that make them go a little nuttier than others. Um, so you wanna identify your antecedent, okay, we know the behavior is going to be that crazy bonkers, bananas, pulling, barking, whatever it might be. And now we have to start thinking about consequences. So if the behavior is continuing, you know that there's some sort of a reward system in there. And it could just be that they are inherently rewarding themselves because barking and being crazy is awesome. So when we do this, after we've of course addressed any health issues that might be causing them to be a little bit more nutty, we're gonna start with positive reinforcement. So we're gonna start to positively reinforce good cho uh, choices that are not barking or being crazy at others. So you can play a game called look at that. And it's super easy and it's something I recommend for a lot of people. So if you've got a dog that barks at the windows, you're gonna sit with your dog right by that window that they like to hang out at and bark. Uh, if your dog's barking on leash outside, what I would recommend is start doing this at first by maybe sitting on your porch or if you've got a nearby park, you can start to expand, you can go sit there. And you're just gonna hang out with them. And then when they see something that you know they might get crazy about, you're gonna catch them before they do. You're gonna say, look at that. And then you're going to mark, so a quick yes or a click, as long as they're not being crazy, and you're gonna stuff a treat in their mouth. And what you're gonna find over time, because they got to develop that association between, oh, when those kids run down the street, I hear, look at that, and then mom gives me a hot dog, that's pretty cool. What you're gonna to start to see is over time, when you say, look at that, they're gonna anticipate that treat, and instead of focusing on what was causing them to go nuts, they're gonna turn and they're gonna look at you you are now more valuable to them than that item that allowed them to go bonkers because you are consistently rewarding that choice to stay calm and look at you. I use that with every single one of my dogs um, and with my one dog, Carmen, who suffers from terrible anxiety. It actually helps keep her under threshold and it helps keep her confident because she knows if she's not sure, she can turn and look at me. 
And not only does she get to see me and see that I'm confident in her, but she gets a reward for it too. So she gets all of these positive things for choosing calm. And it's really helped her with impulse control. Now for dogs that are on leash especially, um, but you can use this for a window barker too, you can teach them what's called an exit cue. So an exit cue uh, just gives them a specific cue you're gonna give that lets them know it's time to move on, let's get out of here. Um, and so when you're walking, you can teach this just in practice without any stimulus going on. You're gonna walk, I tell my dogs this way, you can do whatever you'd like, uh, but I will tell my dogs this way and then we're gonna change directions. So that way it's this way, change direction. As you turn with me, there's a treat right there in your face or drop down the ground, or maybe we'll run a little bit because that's fun. And so they know when they hear this way, they're like, where are we going, mom? And they look at me. That's super handy uh, because I have a dog who's working on some reactivity towards other dogs. She really wants to get over there and play and gets a little loud about it. So when we see another dog right now, I'm doing this way and she goes, oh, there's a dog, but you, okay, we're going this way. And she's gonna turn and look at me and we trot off the other way and she gets a treat for that. Um, it's teaching her some impulse control because we're getting closer and closer to the dogs before I give that this way cue and we move away. Um, it's teaching her that there is an out. So if she is getting frustrated or upset by the fact that that dog is there and she can't play with them, there's an out. There's an easier way to go that's less frustrating for you. Um, and that gives her a positive way to get out of that behavior. Uh, this is also great for any dogs that might be reacting because they're fearful. So if you're terrified at, uh, of other dogs and there's a dog coming towards you, of course you're gonna puff up and get big and bad and mean and bark. But if your owner can give you a, this way an option to get away from them, you're gonna start looking for that rather than that fight response that we see in dogs. And then of course you can teach other incompatible behaviors. So look at that as an incompatible behavior. Rather than barking and lunging, you're gonna turn and look at me. The exit cue is incompatible. You can do some others. Um, so one of my dogs, I worked with her, uh, she could get barky at people when they walk by. So now instead, when she sees people and she gets nervous, she sits and then she gives me her paw. So we do something else as part of a routine to distract her from that stimulus that would cause her to be reactive. Now in terms of management, again, we covered these as a few examples earlier, um, but you need to alter your environment. So again, think back to those antecedents. So cover your windows if you've got a dog that's barking at the windows. If doorbells make them go bonkers, either get a quiet doorbell that just goes to your phone or tell people to knock only. Uh, or if you've got visitors coming over and that's where the reactivity stems, you can take your dog outside until everyone's in and settled, or you can place them in a crate. Um, so definitely make sure that you're considering all of that. Um, and again, if reactivity is on a leash, other management techniques, again, can be changing directions, crossing the street, giving space to hopefully reduce that stress. Okay. Uh, poor recall is another that I know a lot of folks have had some struggles with. Uh, why won't my dog come to me when I call? Uh, so when we're doing this for training, you have to think about what's motivating your dog. And if they're not coming to you, it's not you. So you have to pay attention to what has got your dog's attention. And especially if you're trying to call from outside, it could be any number of things, squirrels, different smells, there could be bugs in the grass. You don't know what's got your dog's interest, uh, but you have to make yourself the coolest thing possible. And the way we do this is we have to start small. So again, when are you recalling your dog that you have trouble? You know, have we barely worked on calm and now they're outside playing and you're calling them to come in? They may not come to you. So we need to start working on this again in a small, understimulating environment. So you are the most interesting thing and then start to expand your expectations for when they're going to come to you as you call them. Uh, you can also apply uh, operant conditioning through positive reinforcement. Uh, treats, you want to use treats? I bolded that. I made it big because in this particular behavior, it is so important. I see so many folks that have dogs that do not come to them when they call. And that's a safety concern for me because if your dog gets out of your yard, is running towards the street, I want to know that everybody, when they tell their dog to come here, that dog turns around and comes right on back to them. So if we want that behavior to be secure and solid for us, we have to reward it. So it doesn't have to happen all the time, but especially when you're first starting to ask your dog to come when called, make sure you have a lottery worth of treats. So when I first start working with my dogs, we work in the house and I will plan it specifically and I will call one of them to come to me. And when they come, I have a handful of baked chicken that I drop on the ground for them. So when they come, they get paid and they get paid big time. So they know that coming to me is more valuable than doing whatever else they were doing. Okay. Now, we also need to pay attention when we are training our dogs to come when called, that we're being consistent. So we're using the same cue. I see that often where it's come, come here, come on, let's go. 
dogs don't generalize. They know one thing. So they're going to know come or come here or whatever you've done, but you get one. So make sure they know what that one thing is and you use it consistently and everyone in your house does. Also make sure that you're paying attention with the positive reinforcement uh, that you're not just asking your dog to come when bad stuff's going to happen. So if your dog goes outside and the only time you call them to come to you is when you are going to put them inside in a crate, maybe leave and go to work every morning. Well, of course they're not going to come because that means bad things are happening. Even if there's treats, you're leaving them. So make sure that you practice. Uh, you know, on nice days, I let my dog stay out in my backyard pretty much all day long. And I will periodically just go to the door, ask them to come to me. And when they come, they get a treat and they can go right back outside and play. So they know that come doesn't always mean a negative thing. Okay. Now for management, uh, when we're working on recalls, the biggest thing is making sure you're maintaining contact with your dogs at all times. So leash walks only, uh, you stay within your own yard. Um, if you're working on recalls outside, you can get longer leashes. So you can start with a classic six foot leash and then you can move on to extended 12 foot, 20 foot, there's 30 foot and even beyond to allow your dog to roam while you still have contact with them because you don't want to release that until you've got a solid recall. All right, and then the last example I wanted to give was one for jumping. Um, so jumping is a common issue that we see all the time. And it's actually one of the really common reasons we see animals that are brought into the shelters because they become a little bit unmanageable. Uh, and jumping can sometimes lead to further excitement, which might be mouthiness. Um, and we wanna try to avoid that obviously with our dogs, especially if you've got a big kiddo like the one I put in the picture. Uh, so you have to think about what's motivating your dog. And in most cases, it's attention. So they jump on us because they want to get something from us. Um, and most of the time that's play or pets or just any sort of contact with us. We see jumping a lot when we just got home from work, when we get back from vacation, things like that. Because our dogs are jazzed to see us. And now as exciting as that is, it also can hurt, knock us over. We want to make sure that we don't encourage it. So we're going to apply operant conditioning through positive reinforcement which means that we're going to positively reinforce anything that is not jumping. So if your dog gets to you and before they jump up, if you can throw treats on the ground, you have now rewarded them for approaching you with all four paws on the ground. That's a positive way to stop them from jumping. And I've seen a lot of people, if you prepare properly, you come through the door, you've got treats you put in your pocket. The minute your dog gets close to you, toss those treats on the ground and you'll see very, uh, very, very quickly, your dogs are gonna start to run at you and they'll skid to a stop and then they'll wait because they know treats are coming and that's gonna be positive for them. We can also use negative punishment by removing our attention. So if your dog jumps on you, even if it hurts a little bit, it can be hard, ignore them, turn your back. You have to walk away, go to a different room. Now for management, you're gonna be looking at baby gates. So stopping them from performing that behavior at all by blocking them from getting to your door or wherever they might be doing their jumping, maintaining them in a separate room, especially if you've got visitors coming over. And then again, those special toys or treats to distract, that can be an awesome way to sort of stop the behavior before it happens. And then that can give you an opening for training. So for example, if your dogs run at you and you toss treats on the ground and they stop to eat those, awesome. You've now lowered their excitement level. They're below threshold, they can listen. And now when they turn to look at you again, Again, that's an opportune time to work on a sit, for example. So instead of running and jumping at me, run over here and sit down, and then I'm going to pet you. Uh, so that's a great way to help address that particular issue. Okay. Now I know I think I went a little over. I'm so sorry. I talk way too much. Uh, so I'm going to do just really quickly. Um, when we're talking about behavioral problems, I stress this again in every presentation, uh, a tired dog is a good dog. So you wanna make sure that you are addressing all of their enrichment needs. Uh, so you wanna provide a positive outlet for natural behaviors, some of which we may not like, but dogs need to do because they're dogs. Uh, now there's many categories for enrichment, but I love to just make sure we touch on physical and mental, especially, because um, this is gonna cover a lot of your dog's bases. If you've got a dog that's excessively barking, overreacting on leash, jumping on you like crazy, can't settle down, it's likely that their enrichment needs are not being met. So they may not be getting enough exercise, and that can mean more walks for you, more playtime in the backyard. Um, it can be letting them play with other dogs if they're social. It can depend, you've got options, but they're likely to have excess energy they need to burn. Um, there's lots of great ways that you can do that, whether it's just through general play, uh, whether you get involved in canine sports, or again, you're engaging in lots of walks and runs. Uh, mental enrichment is one of the things that's most overlooked for dogs and often the root cause of most behavioral problems. Um, so we wanna make sure that we're allowing our dogs to exhibit natural behaviors. So for example, dogs are foragers um, naturally, which means eating out of a bowl is not mentally engaging for them. 
Uh, so you can do things like scatter feeding. Um, when the weather's nice, I really up the ante for my dogs. I take their kibble and I throw it in my backyard and they have to go find it if they want to eat their breakfast. That's a natural behavior for them. They get to use their noses, they're walking around, they're engaging with their environment and they get to find their food. And then when they come in, they're so mentally exhausted from that activity, they lay down and take a nap for an hour. Um, you can sort of mirror that with slow feeders, which are bowls that have grooves and different shapes in them to slow the process so they have to root around and find it. And you can use puzzle feeders as well. Uh, you can let them sniff. So when you're going out for walks with your dogs, make sure you give them time to explore their environment and sometimes even let them choose their own way. You'll find you go on a much more interesting walk and it actually tuckers your dogs out a little faster. And then of course training, whether that's basic manners, trick training or cooperative care, those can all be things that will enrich your dog and help diminish any unwanted behaviors just by providing them with what they need in terms of that outlet for natural behavior. Okay. And of course you wanna make sure you keep it exciting. So this is just an example of an enrichment calendar that uh, I've used in the past. Um, and that I've seen many shelters use as well. So you'll see that there's some consistent things that they do throughout the week, like scent of the day. So you can get different aromatherapy scents and spray them in your environment, walks, music, those can all be regular things. And then every day you can change it up a little bit. So they get a different special toy to play with, a different activity, um, anything like that to kind of keep their environment fresh and interesting and keep them mentally engaged with you. Not only can this help inadvertently diminish un undesirable behaviors. It helps build that bond with your animal, which again is gonna make them further inclined to turn to look at you for any advice or guidance when something stressful occurs, rather than overreact and bark or pull or jump or do any of those things we don't want them to do. Okay. And of course, make sure you leave time for relaxing. So many pets don't know how to relax properly. We need to teach them that. So make sure they have a safe space, somewhere they can go where we will leave them alone. That's especially important if you've got kiddos in the house. Calming music is great. Amazon has dog channels. Um, and if you've got an HD TV, they can actually watch the screen. They can see it. And it'll give them soothing noises from nature that are appealing to dogs. Uh, my dogs have TV on for most of the day when I'm gone. Give them something to watch. Um, just make sure you do give them some quiet time as well, because just like with us, background noise can get annoying for dogs. Um, and then mat work. So you can teach a dog to lay near you on a bed, for example. Um, and, and in fact, all three of my dogs are laying on beds just off screen here. And I've been tossing them treats as I've been talking to you. I'm training while we're doing this because I'm rewarding them for laying on their mats and relaxing rather than running around and being crazy. Uh, and it's easy. All you have to do is give them a comfy place to lay and just randomly start tossing treats down for them. It gives them a reward for calming down, which is something that we always want to see our dogs able to do. Okay. All right. Now, you may find at some point you need a professional. So if you are getting to the point where you've tried all you think you can try and you can't fix it, you need professional help. Uh, definitely seek out your veterinarians because if you've got an issue, I always like to start and see if there's not a medical or health related issue first um, that we can correct that will solve the behavior. Uh, veterinarians, especially veterinary behaviorists, those that specialize in animal behavior can also help you with any medications that you might need. Uh, and I always like to stress that Dogs have mental health issues just like we do. They have imbalances in their brain chemicals as well. Oh, sorry, here's Carmen, she's coming to say hi. Um, so we wanna make sure, hi Carmen. Okay. So we wanna make sure that that's addressed. So Carmen here, for example, has anxiety. I know that. That's not something that I can fix through training alone. So she sees a veterinary behaviorist and she is on anti-anxiety meds to help her with her behavioral issues. And it's worked wonderfully for her. So it is definitely something you wanna consult a professional about. Then you can work with trainers for your more basic manners or correcting small problems. And then there are behavioral consultants as well that specialize in more concerning issues. So if you're dealing with an animal that's got aggression, severe resource guarding, anything that you're finding is presenting, especially a safety issue for yourself or your pet, you wanna seek out a behavioral consultant. Now, when you do that, these are some of the questions that you need to ask. So you wanna make sure that you're getting information on their training methods and every trainer should be specific. They're gonna tell you what they are and what they believe in and they should be proud to tell you. Uh, you wanna know how you're going to be involved in the process and when. You wanna get an idea of how long that person has been working with animals, where they receive their education, if they continue their education. So I take new courses every couple of months to make sure I stay on top of the newest science and animal behavior. Any trainer worth their salt will tell you the same. They should also be willing to provide you with uh, contact details or testimonials from former clients. They should always invite you to observe a training session so you can see what they are doing. And one of the best questions I tell everyone to ask a trainer when they are working with a professional is ask them how long it'll take to see results. 
because if the trainer knows what they're doing, they're going to tell you it depends on your dog because every training plan is going to be different. Every learner learns differently. I never trust a trainer that tells you in 14 days or 30 days, you're going to have a brand new dog because there's no way to guarantee that unless they're using aversive methods, which is going to cause behavioral problems for you later on. Okay. And then lastly, make sure that you are asking if you're going to be able to continue training with your dog and that trainer after they finish their program. Do they have any follow-up? Do they do email or phone consultations? Are they going to be there to support you? Because a good trainer should be, and they're going to want to continue to help you out as you continue to grow with your animal. Okay. All right, so that's all for me. Uh, you can learn more if you join us on April 28th for our body language and behavior presentation. Uh, Carmen might join us again as well, uh, and we can talk a little bit about uh, how we can better understand our dogs and how we can work more effectively with them. Uh, so I know I ran over, I'm so sorry, I talk way too much, uh, but if anybody has any questions, I would be happy to answer them. And I left you all with a picture of my three dogs right there. So those are my kiddos. <laughs> That was awesome. Thank you so much, Andy. I do have a question from John. He is asking the best way to stop pawing and scratching of the floor and chair before the dog lays down. Okay. Um, so that is going to be a natural behavior that dogs do. All dogs like to kind of fluff and nest. Um, they do that on purpose. They actually dig up their environment because it frees uh, scents buried in fabrics or in the ground. Um, it lets them learn about their environment before they lay down. Um, so the best things to do to correct that is going to be one, teach just a straight lie down to your dog and really reinforce that behavior. Um, so work with downs, get that cue solid for them so they're responding to you quickly. If you start to see your dog uh, digging around, you can just give them the down cue and you'll see that they'll, they'll go down and settle without that fluffing process. Um, also, you can manage environmentally. Um, so my dogs like to do that. I know they do that. It's a natural behavior, so I allow it. Um, but to protect my couch, I keep blankets over my couch. You know, so uh, I always tell everyone, I probably look a little bit like a hobo when we're home all alone. I've got blankets dragged all over my couch, it, but it protects the fabric from my dog so they can kind of fluff and get comfy the way they naturally want to. And then when we have company over, I just pull all that off and then we've got a nice clean couch. Um, you can also alternatively teach them that there's only certain appropriate places for them to lay down, whether that be on a certain blanket, on a couch cushion, on their own bed, things like that, where you don't mind that behavior. Um, but the best thing to do if you really want it to cease is I would make sure that we're not punishing. We don't want to yell at the dog for doing something that is natural to them but teach them a cue that's gonna get them into that lie down faster. So if you start to see them fluff, that's when you're gonna give that down cue and then you're gonna reward them for just choosing to go down rather than to do the, the fluffing scratching first. All right, very good information. And then um, I think, I don't, I don't know the name Bakes. Uh, did you have a question? Yes. I saw you raise your hand, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> oh. um, yeah, go ahead. Our dog will fetch anything in the house. If we throw a ball, anything, he brings it right back. But if it lands in the grass, he won't touch it. Even like treats or anything, he just like gets out there, gets real close, goes to pick it up and just walks away. Okay. Uh, does, he, does he go, will he walk in the grass normally on his own to like go potty? Yes, yes. he'll run around the grass and sniff and roll in it, but he won't bring stuff back. So um, that doesn't surprise me. So one thing that we, most people don't know about their dogs and it shocks them when a dog will do a behavior in one spot and not in another is that dogs don't generalize. So that's something that drives people nuts when they train. So for example, if I was teaching my dog to sit and I always worked in my living room, if I went out on my deck and asked my dog to sit, they're going to go, I don't know what you mean, because oh. they don't, they don't generalize. So if you play fetch in the house and the dog's like, yeah, I'm going to go get that as you throw it. Well, now you've changed the game. If you throw it outside and it's in the grass, they're like, I don't, what do you want me to do with this? I don't know. So you have to sort of reteach the game and also reward them. So he may have some tactile issues too. I know some dogs, they don't like to put their nose in the grass because yeah. it you know, pokes them and that's not cool. Uh, so you can start rewarding him for getting closer to the grass. So if you hang out with him outside, you see his nose go down to the grass, you can mark, tell him yes or click and give him a treat. So you're rewarding for exploring in that grass. And then you can start to kind of reteach the game of fetch outside. So you want to sit and you want to throw it very close to you. So that way he doesn't have to travel okay. far and get distracted, okay. you know, and then make sure lots of praise when he picks up the toy, when he brings it back, he's the king of the world, make sure he knows that. And then you can start to get the game more expanded and, and a little bit more active like you're doing at home. 
And thank you so much. This was really helpful for us. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank Lots you. Lots of things us. to try. Thank mm -hmm. you. And then we have a question from Wendy is asking any advice for a dog that chases his tail in anger? Oh, um, so it could be, um, so some dogs definitely do that. Um, it's a repetitive motion that some dogs do when they are stressed or frustrated. Um, so I do like to try to work with those as much as I can. We call those stereotypical behaviors. Um, it's the same thing that you see when you go to the zoo. If you see a polar bear that just paces back and forth all day long, they're frustrated um, and they aren't able to demonstrate some sort of natural behavior. And then that's how that works itself out. Um, so it's the equivalent of someone who's maybe nervous and starts chewing on their nails or something like that. It's just a repetitive behavior we do to self-soothe. So with something like that, my first advice is going to be, and I know it's a bummer because it's not an easy fix, but it's going to be to go to the vet uh, and explain that they're doing that behavior. One, before you train or you work on any behavior modification, I want to make sure there's nothing neurological going on, uh, whether that be actually something in the brain that's causing the desire for the stereotypical behavior like anxiety, which we can medicate and, and deal with, um, or if there's not some sort of nerve pain somewhere. So I've seen a number of dogs that demonstrate and develop that stereotypical twirling behavior after their tail when they're actually experiencing some sort of nerve pain along their spine or in their tail itself. So you want to address that. Uh, and then you want to start to really look at antecedents. So what is causing your dog to do that? What happens first that gets your dog twirling? And then we need to start seeing if we can't manage that what happens first. Um, and then you can kind of beat your dog to the punch. So for example, if that dog, your dog starts to do that when you're leaving because they're getting frustrated, well, then we can beat them to the punch. You can make sure that you've got a, a whole cabinet full of special treats that they get to have. So before he starts twirling, when you're walking out the door, here's a bully stick. So you're going to get rewarded for not twirling. You're going to get rewarded when I leave and you can settle down and chew. Um, so that's going to be one of the biggest things. You can also start teaching incompatible behaviors. So if you're, oh, sorry, all my animals are joining me now. So, uh, so if you start teaching incompatible behaviors, um, like, uh, again, if the dog maybe is twirling, it would depend on the circumstance, but if it starts doing that and chasing the tail when, I don't know, maybe new people come over, you can start really reinforcing like crazy a good sit behavior instead. So when people come over, sit, and I'm going to just rain treats down on top of you. So it's fun, it's exciting, it's not as stressful, and we're getting away from that twirling behavior. Uh, but first and foremost, I would definitely seek out a veterinarian. Um, a lot of times that is a behavior that we see when either there's pain involved or there is some sort of higher level anxiety that we're going to need some sort of pharmaceutical support to assist with so we can actually train from there. Okay. okay, thank you. And then we have one more question from John. Best way to stop dogs from ripping up plush toys and socks. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, okay. So here's the answer to that. Uh, it's not going to be easy. Um, so one management, and I know that's hard, especially if you've got kids, um, cause they're not going to remember to always put everything up on that top shelf that the dog can't reach. Uh, but that's going to be critical because ripping up those toys, that's an instinctive behavior for dogs. That's part of their hunting sequence. Uh, they love it. It's self-satisfying. It rewards them intuitively. So they don't need any sort of outside reward to think that that's an awesome thing to do. So if it's available to them, they're going to do it. Uh, so step one in decreasing that behavior is management, management, management. So they can't get into the rooms where the stuffed toys are. Socks are firmly held in laundry baskets or in drawers and behind doors that dogs can't get to. Toys are up on shelves. You've got to stop the access first before you can do any training. And then what I would recommend is teaching a very strong leave it cue. So that way, if you catch a dog going for a sock or a toy, you can say, leave it, and you'll get a strong response for them to either turn away from it if they haven't picked it up or to drop it and come back to you. Um, leave it is pretty easy to train. Um, I always recommend doing it at first, um, you know, do it with something not as high value. So we don't want to start with, with toys, but you're going to offer a dog an item. I often do it with a treat. Um, I'll put it in my hand and in a closed fist. So I'll do something that's medium value, maybe like a pepperoni or something that they think is good. That's kind of smelly. I'll put it in my hand, close it. I'll let the dog sniff. I tell them, leave it. And they're going to sniff around. I let them do so. Once they move their head away from that treat, I'm going to reward. So I'll mark, I'll say yes or click. So they know that that moving away is what I wanted them to do. And then I'll reward them with something better. So I might have a pepperoni in this hand. I've got hot dogs in this one. So if you ignore this, you get something cooler. 
Uh, and then you can start upping your ante and doing it with an open hand. You can put something on the floor and then just cover it with your foot if they start to approach it. Um, then, then you can start working your way up from doing that with food to things like toys. So like put a plush toy on the ground, ask them to leave it. But the minute they do, it's really important that we give them a high value reward. You get something better if you leave my stuff alone. And then over time, you'll see a dog that has a pretty reliable response. If you see him going for those things, you can tell him, leave it. Are you going to get a foolproof dog that never chews on stuffies or socks? Probably not because it's a natural behavior. So that's something we need to sign up for when we bring dogs into our house. Uh, management is key. And then we can work on training to try to reduce the damage when they start chewing on things. Yeah. All right. And then, oh, another question from John. Short, long dog is fearful of going upstairs after a tumble down a few steps, how to build confidence. Leading with treat is not working. I have the same problem with, we have wooden, like two wooden steps mm -hmm. and my one dog will not go up them. So he's sure. stuck. <laughs> so don't lead with a treat. Um, I know that's intuitive. We all want to do it. It makes sense, right? Here's the treat, follow it and go up the stairs. That actually puts a lot of stress on the dog because they really want that treat, but that stair is really, really scary too. And then they get kind of in this mental conflict mode and then they don't know what to do. And a lot of times you'll either see dogs just shut down completely or take off. And sometimes it can even exacerbate the fear because we've added this extra component of frustration to the stairs or whatever else they might be afraid of. Um, so with that, you're going to do something that's called counter conditioning, and um, we're going to use a training methodology that's called shaping. So what we're going to do is we're going to mark and reward approximations to the behavior that we want. So for example, our goal, up the stairs, right? But our dog is afraid of the stairs because they've taken a tumble, or maybe they just don't know what stairs are yet because a lot of dogs get confused by stairs. So what you're going to do is you're going to hang out with your dog. You maybe sit on the floor near the stairs. And if your dog looks at the stairs, you're going to mark, so a click or a yes, and you're going to give them a treat. Good job. You've acknowledged the stairs are there. That's our first step. And we're going to continue to do that. We're going to mark and we're going to reward for the acknowledgement. If you turn your body towards the stairs, I'm going to mark and I'm going to reward. If you take a step towards the stairs, I'm going to mark and I'm going to reward. So you can kind of see where I'm going here. Hmm. Instead of looking for that final behavior, which is going up those stairs, exactly. I'm going to reward you and support you for all of the tiny decisions you make that are going to ultimately get you to that behavior. And what you're going to do is you're going to be consistent. So the first five times they just look at the stairs, I'm going to mark and reward. The sixth time they look at the stairs, I'm going to watch and I'm going to be like, yeah, cool. You looked at the stair. And the dog is going to look at me and go, well, hey, I looked at the stairs before and you gave me a hot dog. Now what do I have to do? And they're going to try something different. So they might turn their shoulders towards the stairs. They might step towards the stairs. And then you just mark that behavior and reward. And you want to stay simple. So maybe that first day you're only going to get the look or maybe the turn towards the stairs and then end. And when the dog is still happy and engaged with you and not stressed out, you can come back to it later that day or the next day and then see if you can get them a little closer to the stairs, get a paw on the stair. Um, but shaping is all about marking and rewarding the steps that you take to get to the final behavior that you want. Um, important caveats, again, just work within your dog's comfort zone. If they're stressed, we're going to dial it down. We'll make it simpler. I'll reward smaller steps for them. Uh, and be willing to let that take a couple of training sessions to get the behavior that you want. Some dogs pick it up quickly and they're gonna go right into it. Some dogs, especially if there's an existing fear issue, they may take a little bit longer, but that's gonna be your best positive way to get them to the behavior that you want. Um, and it's also a fun thing to do once you start teaching your animal about shaping. That's how you teach them all sorts of cool tricks. So shaping is how we teach uh, service dogs how to do things like open up refrigerators and get water out of the fridge and take it to their person or find their medicine bag. It's all done through shaping by marking and rewarding the approximations to that behavior until we get the whole list of movements under their belt. Um, but that would be my advice for anybody that's got some, some stair issues. Um, my oldest dog, Groot, uh, he's there in the middle. He lived in a shelter for three years before I brought him home. He'd never seen stairs before. It took us a month of doing that before he could handle stairs, but now he's a stair champion and he can go up and down them with ease and confidence. So you just have to be patient with them. So, and I'm sorry, my animals are having a small war behind me now. So, <laughs> you know? All right, so hopefully that helps. Um, doing shaping, it's not easy. It takes time, it takes patience, but it will get you there and it'll get you there with a happy dog that's confident in what they're doing. All right. So I think that'll do it then. Thank you so much, Andy. Um, you know, shoot us an email if anyone has any last minute questions mm -hmm. and uh, thank you all. Stay safe and healthy and, uh, you know, good luck with training all your dogs. <laughs> <laughs>